Uh, I'm Song Chan Park from Yonsei University. I'm the chair of this session. I'm very honored. Uh, let me introduce Hitoshi to you. Um, Hitoshi Murayama is Meg Adams, uh, professor of physics at University, University of California, Berkeley. And he, it, he was uh, the former director of uh, Kavli Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe. His, he is now a principal investigator there. <clears throat> um, he is a member of a Science Council of Japan. His, his um, uh, breaking prize uh, OHD in, in uh, fundamental physics as a common member in two, uh, 2016. He's recently appointed as a chair of P5, Particle Physics Project, uh, prioritization panel that decides important projects for the next 10 to 20 years. Probably you, you know Hitoshi as um, the theoretical physicist working in a wide range of topics, particle physics, dark matter, quantum field theory, uh, grand unification, neutrino physics, inflation, and so on. But Hitoshi is also deeply involved in um, experiment. He, he, um, he, was he is involved in Kamland neutrino experiment, and also he leads sumi uh, telescope project. So I think he knows everything about particle physics. <laughs> <laughs> I always think Hitoshi is the leader of our field in our generation. I really um, appreciate his effort and uh, works, including um, anomaly mediation of suji breaking and also Higgs-Lewis theory. <laughs> okay, so let's welcome Hitoshi Murayama. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for general uh, introduction, Johnson. So uh, I'd like to uh, give a talk today about the uh, uh, the understanding gauge theories using anomaly mediation. And this is sort of the, the series of works I've been doing about from a year and a half ago. And, and of course, the idea is that how do we understand non-perturbative dynamics of the strongly correlated theories, including non navigation gauge theories in four dimensions. So this actually goes back a long way when I was a graduate student student, and there was an assistant professor, he was much younger back then, of course, uh, who actually made the following remark, which really sort of uh, 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 remained in my mind for a long time. So what he said is that what is important in physics is come up with a good zeroth order approximation. So when you're trying to understand strongly correlated systems, non perturbative dynamics, which is very difficult to understand, the question is, can we come up with a good zeroth order approximation where you can get started uh, in some controlled uh, uh, approximation. And, and so it turns out that my claim is actually very simple. This is the main point. Uh, so there are actually very few methods to study strongly coupled systems such as QCD, because you have to really understand non-perturbative dynamics, non-perturbative effects are essential in understanding it. It turns out that once you actually have supersymmetry on top of it, it makes exact analytic studies of non perturbative effects possible, which, which goes back to the famous works by Cyborg and Witten and so on. But they're actually too beautiful in a way because of the high level of the symmetries. So that's sort of the spherical cow. And what we like to understand is the real cow, but that's, that's still very difficult to do because it's a long way from this beautiful supersymmetric limit. So it turns out if you actually start with the spherical cow, but introduce only an infinitesimal amount of supersymmetry breaking in a very specific fashion called anomaly mediation, that will still allow for exact solutions. And therefore you can solve the system exactly. And it turns out that it's not quite the real cow, but it starts to look like a cow, not just a completely spherical cow. So that's the main point I'd like to make today. So I've been working with a bunch of collaborators on this subject. And the last one is actually an application of this idea to one plus one dimensional condensed matter system as well. So technique is not limited to four dimensional gauge theory. And I believe there are many other examples that can come along this, this line of thinking. So anyway, that's the main point I'd like to make point out today. So uh, now, especially the younger generations may not be too familiar with supersymmetry. Now that AOSC didn't find this, I'd like to get started with a little bit of introduction here. And that a very simple prototype of supersymmetry is actually the Andau levels, namely the motion of electron in a uniform magnetic field if you actually assign the g factor of two. 
So what I mean by this is the following. So if you have a constant magnetic field, you introduce this vector potential to your Hamiltonian. We know all well that its energy levels are given by the same energy levels as the harmonic oscillator, where the angular frequency is given by the cyclotron frequency. And there's a large amount of the degeneracies that are each energy levels given by, by basically the churn class, uh, namely the total magnetic flux going through this two-dimensional plane. And there is, of course, zero point energy, which is given by one half, and that's the energy spectrum of this Hamiltonian. But if you remember that the electron has spin, and then add additional term, which has to do with this magnetic field moment coupling to the magnetic field, and specifically when G factor is two, then all of these energy levels, of course, shift by this amount. And what happens then is that you have the energy levels of spin up and energy levels of spin down. And you see that two spin orientations have exact degeneracy, except for the ground state. So except for the ground state, every state is actually paired between spin up and spin down. And the reason for it is that this system actually secretly has supersymmetry in it. And then this degeneracy is explained by having an operator, Q, which is defined by this form here. And it turns out that Hamiltonian can be written as Q squared once you include this uh, magnetic moment coupling with G factor two. And this Q operator has spin in it. So it takes this state and turn that into that state and vice versa. So let me for the moment code all of these states as bosonic states and all of these states are fermionic states. Then you find a pairing between the bosonic and fermionic states, which is nothing but supersymmetry. And when the Hamiltonia is non-zero, which is not the, uh, uh, the ground state, but all the excited states, then you, Q squared, of course, gives you the energy eigenvalue. So when you act this Q operator on the fermionic state, that turns into bosonic state with a normalization factor given by the square root of energy. In the same way, if you act this Q operator on the bosonic state, you find a fermionic state with a normalization factor given by the square root of energy. But clearly ground state is different because energy is exactly zero, as you can see. So it turns out when you act Q on it, you get zero. And that's why this ground state doesn't have a fermionic partner. So that's the structure of the supersymmetric theories. Namely, the ground state may not be paired, but all the excited states are paired. And so that's the structure of the, the, the Hilbert space for supersymmetric theories in general. So this case is kind of simple because all of these energy states are equally spaced. That is special for this case of the uniform magnetic field. Suppose you make the magnetic field non-uniform or something like that. Then of course, they are not equally spaced anymore. But the fact that a Hamiltonian can be written as Q squared still remains. So the pairing still remains again, except for the ground state. So ground state may not be paired, but excited states are all paired. And this actually brings up this idea called topological invariant. So the idea is that when you actually change the parameter of the system, like changing the magnetic field uh, diabetically from one type to another, and all of these energy eigenstates move up and down accordingly, but the pairing remains. So when, for example, this pair of states between bosonic and fermionic start to come down, they come down as a pair. And at some point, accidentally, maybe they're going to hit exactly zero energy. But if you subtract that number of zero energy states for the boson and number of fermionic states from the, the fermion, and if you do a subtraction between boson and fermion, that difference doesn't change in this process because when this pair comes down to zero, then bosonic states increases by one but also that's the fermionic state. So in terms of difference, they cancel. So this difference doesn't change. Therefore, this difference is a topological invariant, which doesn't change as you continuously vary parameters of the theory. And because all the excited states always cancel, you can generalize this expression to actually trace of something like a uh, Boltzmann factor. But for a given energy states, you assign this sign whether the state is boson or fermion. And this is what is called the Witten index. And this Witten index, therefore, is a topological invariant, which gives you a very powerful tool to understand dynamics of the theory. 
Another special thing about supersymmetry is that the ground states may be highly degenerate. And in this case, it's a finite number, but in many cases, they are actually infinitely degenerate, which is called the moduli space of the ground states or vacua. And that's because, again, Hamiltonian is given by Q squared. If you find a solution that the state is supersymmetric, namely it's annihilated by the charge Q, then that state is automatically a ground state. And in many cases, you find infinite number of solutions to that condition. So you have this infinitely degenerate space of the ground states called the moduli space. But of course, once you break supersymmetry a little bit, the moduli states get modified, get lifted, and you tend to find isolated set of the ground states. So this is only changed only a tiny bit, but then it starts looking like the system in non-supersymmetric theories, because you wouldn't expect such a kind of exact continuous space of the ground states in ordinary theories. But once you break supersymmetry, even just a tiny bit, you end up finding they, a, only a, a finite number of ground states appear in the end. And then it starts looking like a normal supersymmetric theories. So that's what I meant by just introducing a tiny bit of supersymmetry breaking, then the cow starts look like a real cow. It's not a real cow yet, but it can, obtain all the qualitative feature of the real cow, which you don't get from a spherical cow. So that's the idea of my talk today. So let's apply this idea to pure Mills theory. So what's mm -hmm. known for the pure Mills theory? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, before, before we, so is this written index in the Landau level problem related with any, some topological invariant? Yes, such it is. Number? It, yeah, it is nothing but the first churn number. Oh, really? So this topological invariant, as you see, is the number of boson minus number of fermions. So you are basically counting the number of degeneracies of the ground state, which is given by the first churn class. So it is indeed a topological invariant. So this written index is defined from the quantum theory point of view, but also from purely uh, from the mathematical point of view, which is nothing but the topological invariant churn class of this fiber bundle, U1 fiber bundle in this case. I see, thank you. Okay. Yeah, Any other you. questions? By the way, this spherical cow is what I take, took from Wikipedia, which is very useful. So now I apply this idea to pure Mills theory. So when you have the a pure yeah, Mills theory, namely non abelian gauge theory like SUN, that's obviously generalization of Maxwell's theory, but it's of course, as you know, it's non-linear theory because of this uh, non-commutative nature, namely given by the structure constant, which gives you the interaction among the gauge bosons like gluons in the case of QCD. And theory doesn't have any dimensional full parameter. The coupling constant is actually dimensionless, but, it is believed to develop actually a mass gap from the non perturbative phenomenon. And the numerical simulation using that as QCD supports this idea called dimensional transmutation. Classical Lagrangian doesn't have any dimensional full parameter, but the theory develops a dimensional full parameter, namely the mass of the excitation. And this is actually very similar to, for example, one dimensional antiferromagnet with the integer spins. So this development of mass gap in pure Young Mills theory is actually one of the uh, millennium problems by the Cray Mathematical Institute. So if you can actually prove this happens, then you are supposed to earn a prize of a million dollars. So that's definitely worth trying, right? And so we can solve this problem analytically. That's why non perturbative physics is different, uh, difficult. But again, we can introduce a gluinos, namely fermions, in the adjoint representation of the gauge group. And if you add this gluino to the problem, or gaugeino uh, for generating the gauge boson, then this actually is already an, an example of supersymmetric theory. So the gauge boson and this Y fermion are the super partners to each other, namely the gauge boson is what is called the gauge genome. And Witten, knowing that this Witten index are topological invariant, came up with this following analysis. So he actually put the system into a finite size box. And if the size of the box is much bigger than the inverse size of the mass gap, then this is basically just imposing periodic boundary condition space because all the extensions are much more short range. It's not going to change physics at all. But now since it's in a finite box, then you can squeeze the size of the box all the way down to zero as an adiabatic change. And based on the argument, which I mentioned already, that the number of vacua should not change by that adiabatic change of the parameter, namely the size of the box. 
But once you squeeze the size of the box down to zero, then all the, the modes of the fields, which have the non-zero momentum in the spatial directions would attain the infinite energies. So they all decouple from the theory. The only things you have to analyze are the zero modes. And that's something you can do. It turns out that the quantum field theory in this limit reduces to quantum mechanics. Then you can count the number of vacua using this quantum mechanical system. And then he found that there are actually NC ground states of this quantum mechanics. Namely for SUNC, pure and Mills theory, once you make it supersymmetric, then you know the number of vacua is given by the number of colors. And at the same time, this analysis also can show that there is actually a mass gap, which is parameterized and the vacua as parameterized by the condensate of the gauge or bilinear. And this is something we expect to see in ordinary QCD, where we expect the quark bilinear would condense and break chiral symmetry. In this case, chiral symmetry is anomalous and it's only the Z to NC subgroup is unbroken, which is still an exact symmetry. And it turns out that this Z and 2 and C gauge group, uh, the global symmetry is further broken down to Z2 by the virtue of this NC rule of unity. And they are NC vacua. Each of them correspond to one NC root of unity. So that corresponds to a particular phase of this gauge you know, bilinear. And hence they are uh, consistently NC vacua of this uh, the, the, the system. And so this is what we know in the exact supersymmetry limit. Once you do break, break supersymmetry though, what you can do is basically add the mass term for the gauge geno. And once you add the mass term to the gauge geno, then the theta term, this topological term becomes physical because you cannot rotate this away by the chiral transformation anymore. <laughs> and in this limit, you can still work out the ground states exactly and it turns out that the degeneracy between among these NC vacua get lifted. And as you actually change theta parameter, you start to actually go along this line of the circle. And when you actually reach the next vacuum and halfway in between, you switch from one ground state to another. So that's what is showing this picture. As you change theta, starting from one ground state, your vacuum energy changes like this. Once one theta becomes pi, you go over to the, another ground state, and then you come back along this red line. If you don't switch, your ground state energies keep increasing along this uh, zigzag, but that's not the ground state, obviously. So that's why you have to make a switch. Namely, there's a first order phase transition at the, the theta of pi from one ground state of one phase of the gauge geno bilinear to the other ground state of another phase of gauge geno bilinear. So you even understand the impact of topological term on the non perturbative dynamics. So I said this already, the generous is lifted and, and, and it turns out that you can still solve this system exactly. So it turns out in this case, you can sort of put in this mass of the gauge you know, by hand, but this actually turns out to be a special case of anomaly mediation supersymmetry breaking as I would explain in a few minutes from now. So it turns out that this idea that supersymmetry gauge theory perturbed by the infinitesimal anomaly mediation supersymmetry breaking is still exactly solvable, non-perturbatively, and so that you can understand the qualitative feature of the gauge theory exactly, at least near supersymmetry limit. And whether that would go on uh, continuously to non susy limit remains some discussions, and I'll come back and talk about that later, but nonetheless, this is what I meant. But the minute you introduce a tiny bit of supersymmetry breaking, spherical, spherical cow that didn't look like a real cow at all, all of a sudden starts looking like a real cow. cow. It shows the, all the right qualitative features of the real cow you expect in the non susy limit. Okay, so that's the, the main point I'd like to get across today. So now I'd, I'd like to briefly review what we actually know about dynamics of QCD, namely the theory of the strong nuclear force. I still vividly remember what, what I, how I felt when I first learned about this back in grad school, whether this QCD is a very complicated non-trivial problem. And when you first learn about it, this is what you get told. Look, here's a proton, but there are actually quarks inside and the quarks are colorful and beautiful. But unfortunately, you can never see those quarks. You can never take them out. But believe me, there are actually these colorful, beautiful quarks in them. If you get told that, 
you know, I felt like it was like an internet scam. We still receive all these internet scams every day. You know, you get fooled by this. Some people actually end up paying a lot of money because of this. So it, it sounds like it. Who would believe in that kind of scam? But eventually you get also told that the fact that you can never take these colorful quarks out of the proton is what is called confinement. Okay, now it sounds like a technical term, maybe something uh, uh, important about it. And we also get told that this is a consequence of the negative beta function in asymptotic freedom, namely the coupling constant becomes weak at high energies, but becomes strong at low energies. And because it becomes so strong that low energies and long distances it would eventually not allow you to take the quarks out of it. But of course, this is still not a proof because it's only a qualitative argument. We know that there are some asymptotically free theories which may not actually confine, but become conformal and go to infrared fixed point at low energies. So, you know, it still doesn't quite explain why we cannot take these quarks out of the proton. And there's another puzzle. We know the protons and pions are made of the same quarks, namely up and down quarks. But how come then that the bound state of up quark and anti-up quark, namely pion, is so much lighter compared to the bound state of two up quarks and down quark, namely a proton? And it sounds very mysterious. And the fact that pion is so much lighter than proton is actually important for us to exist. So if you look at the spectrum, here's the pion, here's the proton. They are made of the same things, but their masses are so different from each other. And that's important because if the pion was as heavy as proton. Then pion exchange, as originally suggested by Yukawa, gives you a finite range nuclear force whose range is given by the inverse pion mass. So if pion is heavy, the strong force doesn't go over the size of the proton. So the strong force cannot be mediated to the next proton inside the nucleus. Therefore, they cannot bind with each other because they would repel each other with the electric force, which is repulsive, then there will be no nuclei. Only because pion is light enough that its range goes beyond the size of the proton, then nuclei can bind and we can exist. So unless we understand this phenomenon, then all the elements we have in the universe would all disappear. The only thing that remains would be hydrogen. So the fact that pion is light is actually very important for existence. Of course, we get told that there's some qualitative explanation to all this. And one of them is this idea to explain confinement by the dual Meissner effect that go back to my late colleague, Stanley Mandelstam. So the idea is that in the ordinary superconductor, what is condensed is actually a charged object, namely the Cooper pairs of electron. And once the charged objects condense, then the magnetic field gets squeezed into flux tubes, namely abricots of flux. So if you actually interchange electric and magnetic from this argument, and instead of assuming a condensation of electrical charges, but rather a condensation of magnetic monopoles, then what gets squeezed would be the electric field. So once you have this system with the condensate of the magnetic monopole, then the color electric fields produced by quarks, which stretches between quark and anti-quark, will be confined into electric flux tube. And therefore, the energy between quark and anti-quark, which is given by the length of the flux tube, goes with the distance between quark and anti-quark. And if the energy goes with the distance linearly, then that means there is a constant force. So you can never escape this potential, and therefore, quarks are confined. And that's the idea called dual Meissner effect. And this idea, of course, based on something we know, which you can measure in the laboratory, is sort of makes sense. And another thing that came out from the theory by Nambu is the idea of the chiral symmetry breaking. So again, this is an issue of the zeroth order approximation. It turns out it is a good zeroth order approximation to assume all the quarks in QCD are massless. And once you assume that quarks are massless, you have an enhanced global symmetry of SUNF left cross SUNF right cross U1 baryon number. And if you assume that this global symmetry is broken to diagonal subgroup of SUNF vector, then there is a symmetry breaking of global symmetries, and therefore there are number Golston bosons. And if you assume that pi on belongs to the number Golston bosons, which is the adjoint representation of SUNF, which are supposed to be massless in this limit, 
you now understand why pion is supposed to be light. So in the real world, you are away from this the, the zero thought approximation because the quarks have finite mass and therefore pi is slightly massive, but nonetheless it's light because it's pretty close to this zero thought approximation of the massless quarks. But it's still not quite an explanation to this puzzle because you know, how do you know that they're actually magnetic monopoles in QCD? And people try to come up with the monopole configuration by some kind of artificial gauge fixing called the Abelian projection, but it's never was at least clear to me whether there was a gauge artifact or something physical. So even the presence of magnetic monopoles is not clear. And also the fact that this symmetry is broken to diagonal subgroup by this quark by the new condensate is an assumption in Nambu's argument, it had not been derived from QCD. So we are still not quite there yet. So I still feel like this is still just a, a sophisticated version of internet scam. Now, of course, we feel even better after the work based on the Witten and Cyberg by assuming supersymmetry. So in the case of highly supersymmetric N equal to super Yang Mills theory, it turns out that there is a complex scalar field in adjoint representation. And once that complex scalar field acquires an expectation value, which is an exact moduli space of vacua I mentioned earlier, then on that ground state, the SU2 gauge group, for instance, gets broken to U1. And, and then you have the Coulomb branch, uh, which is actually based on U1 gauge boson. And when SU2 breaks to U1, there's the standard to Poryakov magnetic monopole solution. So monopoles actually do exist in this field theory, which you can work out at least with the classical field equation. And what was very really non-trivial in their work is that they could show along this moduli space of um, vacua, there are two singular points which, where the monopoles or dions become exactly massless. So at this stage, this is still doesn't look like a uh, regular QCD because you still have this uh, infinite number of ground states and where the monopoles and dion become massless are only uh, two points on this infinite number of ground states. There's no reason why they're special at this moment. But you can show in this case by breaking the n equal two supersymmetry down to n equal one supersymmetry by adding the mass term to this adjoint scalar field and knowing that at particular points of moduli space, the monopoles become massless, you can derive the superpotential based on this principle. And by solving for the solution to this superpotential, you can show that the magnetic monopoles have now expectation values given by this perturbation down to n equal one. So this is the way you can really demonstrate that magnetic monopoles do exist and has expectation values. And therefore, you, the theory is supposed to confine. In this case, even further perturb the system to go all the way to no supersymmetry at all by introducing the gain genome mass. And you can also show that this monopole condensation persists. However, this technique doesn't quite work for demonstrating chirosymmetry breaking because n equal to super Yang Mills doesn't have chirosymmetry. It has this specific superpotential that SUNF left and SENF right is broken to diagonal subgroup already in the, in the UV Lagrangian. So you don't have chirosymmetry to speak of, which may spontaneously break. So you have to give up this beautiful n equal two theories. And then you have to go to n equal one supersymmetry, which has been worked by Vanati Cyberg and his collaborators. But it turns out that solutions he has found doesn't seem to resemble what we know about non-supersymmetric QCD at all, the phases appear to be too unusual to expect for non-supersymmetric theories. In some cases, you even don't have ground states. So this is what I'm calling spherical cow. They don't resemble the real cows at all. But what I'd like to show is that by turning on just a tiny bit of supersymmetry breaking, it turns out that this spherical cow now starts looking like a real cow. And that's what I would like to demonstrate to you today. So this is the sort of the schematics of what I'm saying. So this Can is I, m equals zero. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so in the confinement mechanism, as far as I know, there is one popular version, center for this condensation in G, GNC case, center vortex condensation, center vortices. Okay. Yeah. So. Can you comment on, I mean, compared with some monopole, your monopole and G 
CNC center vortices. So, and also, is there any supersymmetric version for center vortex condensation? Okay, so center vortex condensation, I believe, has to do with the fact that you have this electric flux tube. So that's the vortex, and and then the the uh, the, the center symmetry is is still intact in it. For example, if you use the Kyle Lagrangian description of the, uh, the the QCD, then in some cases you do find pi one of the coarsest space to be non-trivial, and therefore you actually do find solitonic vortex configuration. And so that seems to be actually in one-to-one -one correspondence to the picture of the confinement, even though in ordinary QCD, the confinement actually is not the, uh, this, uh, the, the center symmetry because the center symmetry is already broken by, the, by having this fundamental, uh, the quarks in a fundamental representation. So it turns out that there's no uh, well-defined concept of confinement in ordinary QCD. So you have to go to a different kind of theories like SON gauge theories, where you do have the, the unambiguous un definition of confinement. And what I'm going to show you later is that by using this technique, you can again still see the, uh, the, 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 the monopole uh, appearing in the spectrum, and they do condense that in order to cause confinement. So that's the connection I'd like to uh, show later on. Okay. Then, Am I answering your so, question? Yeah, you are answering my question. So let me ask in this way. So if I consider adjoint QCD, where mm -hmm. center symmetry is certainly exist, then right. we, I can consider two mechanisms, monopole condensation and also or some center vortex condensation. Uh -huh. So can I so, some as far and, as and I both, heard, of, yeah. both of yeah. them work. Yeah. Yeah. So but they are different. So, I believe they, they actually end up meaning the same thing, even though I don't know how to show it. But the qualitative, they look very similar to each other to me. Maybe you have different opinion on this. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So what I'd like to tell you uh, in a moment is this picture. So this M equals zero is the supersymmetric world. M is meant to be the size of supersymmetry breaking. And if you consider SU and C QCD, and if you have nf number of quarks in it, up to the number of flavor of nc minus one, it turns out the theory doesn't have any ground state as what's called a runaway behavior. And certainly that doesn't look like a non supersymmetric QCD at all, that's a spherical cow. If you go a notch up, then you find the infinite number of ground states and, and most of them actually break the barrier number. Again, it doesn't look like non supersymmetric QCD. If you go up to yet another number of flavors, then you find the theory looks like it's confining, but there's no cardiosymmetry breaking. Again, it doesn't look like non supersymmetric limit. And if you go to even further, a higher number of flavors, it, the theory actually goes to what is called the free magnetic field. Theory seems to confine, quark seems to get bound into baryons, but baryons now fragment into a pieces called magnetic quarks. And magnetic quarks end up interacting with the infrared free gauge field, which is different from the original SUNC gauge theory. If you go to even higher number of flavors, then the theory seems to flow to an infrared fixed point and theory becomes conformal. And NF larger than N3 and C, finally the theory loses asymptotic freedom and they become infrared free. On the other hand, what we know about the non susie limit where the SUSY breaking is infinite is very little. If you go above 11 half in C, again, theories are free. Just below this critical value, then theory is believed to flow to IR fixed point, which is called the bank sachs fixed point. So just a notch below this 11 half in C, you can work out the total beta function and you can show that in large NC limit, then you can find the fixed point of the beta function even when the, uh, um, uh, the size of the gauge coupling constant is one over NC and, and therefore perturbative. So in this case, fixed point can be shown to exist perturbatively. So that's something we tend to believe in, at least in the large NC limit. On the other hand, for a low number of flavors, we believe there's a chirosymmetry breaking, mostly by the data. And of course, there are supportive evidence from lattice QCD these days. But what ha happens in between is basically not really known. What I'd like to argue today is the minute you introduce this infinitesimal but finite supersymmetry breaking, then you can still solve the theory exactly and demonstrate that there is a chirosymmetry breaking. Therefore, it seems to connect smoothly 
the non-SUSY limit. And for the higher number of flavors, it turns out that chirosymmetry breaking is a local minimum instead of a global minimum. But at least you can work out exactly what this local minimum does. And again, that demonstrates a chirosymmetry breaking, which appears to be continuously connected non-SUSY limit. And so that's the, 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 the this slightly perturbed spheric, spherical cow that starts to look like the real cow I was mentioning earlier. So that's the message I'd like to convey in my talk today. And whether this is really continuously connected, of course, is remains to be seen, but at least it does look like they are connected and therefore they belong to the same universality class. Namely, what do you learn with the infinitesimal Susie breaking carries over to infinite Susie breaking so that the, the feature of the ground state and pattern of supersymmetry breaking, and maybe even some low lying spectrum of the theory seems to carry over smoothly from small SUSY limit breaking to uh, infinite SUSY breaking. And that's the claim I'd like to make today. Okay, so that's a, a smooth phase transition from spherical cow to slightly perturbed spherical cow, which already starts to look like real cow. And to, uh, to actually carry this analysis over, we need to understand a few things about the supersymmetric gauge theories. And supersymmetric gauge theories are highly constrained. For example, what is called the superpotential is not renormalized under any orders in perturbation theory, any finite orders in perturbation theory, but it can receive correction from non perturbative physics. That is very important. The fact that there are a certain number of anomalies you can analyze again exactly tells you, for example, how the gauge coupling constants renormalizes, which is given in terms of this exact formula called NSVZ beta function, which you can show from the path integral formulation, which Nemo and I actually demonstrated some time ago. And, and then in this case theories, you can also find there's some exact renormalization scheme so that the wave function renormalization is uniquely related the running of the beta function, as well as the running of the couplings in a superpotential. So that gives you very non-trivial relations among these different interactions in the theory. That uh, would eventually allow us to analyze the theory exactly. But of course, we have to break supersymmetry. And what we need to do is to break supersymmetry in such a way that we can still solve the theory exactly. And it turns out that the anomaly media supersymmetry breaking, which I worked out with Jan Judy, Che, Michael Sludi, and Ricardo Rattazzi in, in a little competition with Alessa Randall and Raman Sundrum, actually turns out to be a very useful scheme to do so. So, what we need is to like to connect n equal one supersymmetry results by Cyborg and so on to non SUSY gauge theories. So, we have to decouple gauge genome in squawks, namely that we have to introduce finite mass for the gauge genomes and scalar quarks. But the order results are obtained by Cyberg exactly uh, are written in the language of composite operators like mesons and baryons. So what it means is that we need to know how exactly how these composite objects receive the impacts of supersymmetry breaking, which is not trivial. For example, we know in the case of the pions, once you actually turn on the finite mass of the quarks, we know the pion mass turns on as a square root of the quark masses which we think we know because we have this tool called chiral Lagrangian, but it's not non-trivial because by turning on the quark mass, you might expect the pion being the bound state of quark and anti-quark, pion mass arises linearly with quark mass, but it doesn't. So that's why we need to have a special tool to understand how exactly the composite states would require acquire supersymmetry breaking effects. And for this purpose, the idea called anomaly mediation seems to be very useful. So idea is a supersymmetry is broken by some order parameter in the hidden sector with the expectation value of the F component. And in order to maintain the flat universe, you need to cancel that exactly with the finite value of the superpotential as well, which is something you can do in supergravity. But because of this finite, the, uh, the, 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 the order parameter of supersymmetry breaking, then the gravitino actually eats the Goldstino of the spontaneous global supersymmetry, and that's a super Higgs mechanism. So the gravitino acquires a mass, which is proportional to the size of the supersymmetry breaking. And now that gravitino acquired a mass that would transmit effect of the supersymmetry breaking to whatever theory you might have, like a four dimensional gauge theory, where the size of the supersymmetry breaking appears in a Planck suppressed fashion. 
And by assuming that there's no direct interaction between two sectors, it turns out that you know exactly how the supersymmetry breaking effects appear in the gauge theory or any field theory of your interest. And that's the idea called anomaly mediation. So there are two contributions to this. One of them arises at the tree level. If your theory has dimension four parameter, so if W is cubic in phi, which is corresponds to dimensionless coupling, then this is exactly zero and you don't induce any supersymmetry breaking effect. So it turns out that uh, this anomaly with supersymmetry breaking, it actually couples to the amount of breaking of the conformal symmetry. So even if the tree level theory doesn't have dimensional full parameters, just like in QCD, it actually develops dimensional full parameter and then non perturbative effects would end up inducing supersymmetry breaking effects at the tree level, but non perturbatively At the perturbative level, there's also the running coupling constant, which is actually anomalous violation of conformal symmetry, which is called the trace anomaly. So for example, the mass of the gauge geno is induced to the extent that the gauge coupling constant is no longer dimensionless, namely it runs with a beta function. So gauge geno mass is indeed induced proportional to the beta function of the gauge theory. And so is the scalar mass induced by the anomalous dimension of the scalar field and so on and so forth. An interesting thing about this formulae is that you can compute the beta function only knowing the particle content at a given energy scale. If we have decoupled many massive particles at the gut scale, Planck scale, it doesn't affect your calculation of the beta function. And therefore the gauge genome mass is also predicted by knowing physics only at that energy scale. And that is a property called UV insensitivity. No matter how many particles you have decoupled, which are heavy, your prediction on the SUSY breaking is totally insensitive to that. It's only fixed by physics at a given energy scale of your interest. Now, if that sounds too good to be true, you can verify it. For example, you can introduce some massive particle and decouple it. So if you decouple some massive particle, your beta function jumps at the threshold. So then you would predict the gauge genome mass also jumps at the threshold that doesn't sound quite right at the first sight. But it turns out that when you have a massive particle, you have a tree level massless, uh, uh, the dimensional full parameter. And therefore there's a tree level supersymmetry breaking effect, which couples the quark to anti-quark. And if you use this tree level SUSY breaking effect in this one loop diagram, you can show that this generates a correction to the gauge genome mass at the one loop level. And this threshold correction turns out to give you precisely the jumping beta function I just talked about. So this formula is true above the threshold with one bit form of the beta function. It's also true below the threshold with different size of the beta function. And the jump is precisely given by this decoupling of heavy particle at the one loop level. And therefore this formula holds at every energy scales. And if you go to scalar masses, you have to do two loop calculation. It's more complicated, but you can do that nonetheless. And again, you can show that the threshold corrections appear when you integrate out heavy particles so that this formula that the scalar mass squared is given by this anomalous dimension computed at the energy scale of your interest remains true both above the threshold and below the threshold and therefore is UV insensitive. And I was very happy that the Steven Weinberg decided to include this anomaly media supersymmetry breaking in the third volume of his book. And he even thanked me in the, uh, uh, the, the preface. So I was very honored actually by his nice gesture. And of course, it's, it's a really sad, uh, tragic incident that we actually lost this genius Steven Weinberg a few years ago. But anyway, so uh, the anomaly mediation is now enshrined in his historical textbook. So that actually makes me very happy. So now that I talked about all these uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, basic uh, uh, reviews, now we'd like to apply this idea to QCD-like gauge theories based on SU, SO, and SP gauge groups. A Expectation, question? oh, go ahead. Sorry, I think I'm about to lose <laughs> the main story. Line. So in the case of anomaly mediated suji breaking mass, mm -hmm. then you mentioned that the IR physics is determined only by IR physics. That's right. So, so, so 
first thing is I still don't get the meaning of anomaly mediated surge breaking mechanism. So will you explain more? And, and yeah, the yeah. next question is why? Yeah, right. sorry. Yeah. So, so in, in theory, which doesn't have any dimensional full parameter, then this piece identically vanishes. So there is no tree level supersymmetry breaking effects. But the fact that gauge coupling constants run is actually secretly a dimension full theory, which leads to dimensional transmutation, as you know. So there is actually anomalous breaking of the conformal transformation. And that's what we call the trace anomaly. Classically, conformity invariant theory ends up being not conformal quantum mechanically, and that's the origin of the running coupling constants. Conformal trace anomaly is proportional to the beta function of the theory. And yes. it turns out that you induce SUSY breaking effects proportional to amount of the trace anomaly, namely the beta function, and hence anomaly mediation. SUSY breaking effects is induced by the trace anomaly hence anomaly mediation of supersymmetry breaking. Uh, I see. So you, you just couple some supersymmetry theory, some gravity theory, and that gives rise to some cover type effect, some trace right. anomaly. Uh, right. I see. Okay. Right. So uh, is there uh, any... To, yeah. 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 yeah, to be Sorry. more technical, there's a formulation of supergravity based on conformal supergravity, and where the Planck scale is actually spontaneously broken by the condensate of what is called the, uh, the wild compensator field. So the Planck scale is induced in some sense spontaneously, even though it's actually just an auxiliary field, it's not dynamical. And it turns out that, so this conformal breaking done by wild compensator field also carries the information about the gravitino mass. So all the essence of the SUSY breaking that appears in your theory is through the same wild compensator super multiplet. That's why the whole business of supersymmetry breaking actually comes through the violation of conformal invariance. And therefore, it only appears to the extent that theory doesn't have conformal invariance, either at the tree level superpotential or the loop level running of parameters. Is there any non supersymmetric version for this concept, application of this uh, concept? Not that I'm, I'm aware of. Of course, the conformal gravity can be defined, but then the conformal gravity has nothing to do with supersymmetry, and therefore the correlation with the size of supersymmetry breaking gets lost in there. Then, then my next question is why the IR physics is determined by IR physics in this case? Sorry, I didn't well, catch that. Maybe yeah. calling that IR physics is slightly misleading. What I said is that the SUSY breaking is determined by physics at the energy scale of interest. So these are running masses. So you compute the gauge genome mass at a given renormalization scale. And for that calculation, you really need to know the particle content that exists at that energy scale. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something we know and familiar from ordinary chiral anomaly. You can view chiral anomaly either by UV physics coming from the renormalization and regularization, or can yes. also view this as IR physics coming from this uh, uh, triangle diagram, this Coleman, uh, 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 I forgot the other author, but a Coleman's argument based on this IR, uh, the collinear divergences. So you can view anomaly either as UV physics or IR physics, namely that's physics that are all scales in some sense. And this anomaly mediation, SUSY breaking is also of the same character. I see, okay, thank you. It now comes the application to sorry, gauge theory. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Can you say uh, similar words about the extended supersymmetry if n is uh, larger than two or four? Yeah, so if you have n equal to supersymmetry, and it turns out that the anomaly mediation breaks it only down to n equal one. It mm -hmm. doesn't break it all the way to zero. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the fact that you, you can approach non susy gauge theory with anomaly mediation is right now specific to n equal one theory. Mm -hmm. But okay. it turns out that in lower dimensions, you can still do it. So I, I don't actually talk about this today, but you can apply this technique to n equal to CVN sigma model in one plus one dimension, and it breaks supersymmetry. And, and actually you can get the, something similar to non susy results of CVN model. So uh, they, it can be even useful to the, uh, con uh, the condensed matter systems as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, now uh, I don't have that much time left. So now comes the real application. So in the non-SUSY limit, 
we do have expectations on how chiral symmetry is broken. For SU and C gauge theories, we have quarks in a fundamental representation, anti-quarks in an anti-fundamental representation. That's why you have SU and F uh, global symmetry for quarks, separate SU and F symmetry for anti-quarks, which we expect to break to diagonal subgroup. So one in point, for time, okay. you have uh, still 40 minutes. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Time. Okay. So yeah, don't worry. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so for SO and C gauge theory, where quarks are in the vector representation, let's say you have NF of them, then you, you have SU NF global symmetry. And if you assume that there's a QQ bilinear condensate, SU NF global symmetry gets broken to SO NF. In the SP2 and C gauge theory, with the quarks in a fundamental representation, you need to have even number of them to avoid Witten's anomaly. So you have even number of them, and therefore you have SU two NF global symmetry, and we expect the quark by linear condensate to spontaneously break to SP two NF global symmetry. So that's the expectation in non-supersymmetric theories. Now we start to analyze this perturbation from supersymmetry. So again, I'm reviewing this case of the super young mills. In this case, I told you that there are this NC vacua. And, and the ground states are uh, parameterized by this dynamical scale, lambda to 3nc, which is periodic in theta. But the size of the gauge in a bilinear is dimension 3, so you need to take nc root of this value. And when you take nc root of this value, then you have this nc root of unity appearing. And that's the origin of nc vacua of the ground states. But now, now that we have this dimension of full parameter lambda in your superpotential, which comes with the specific root for a given uh, uh, ground state. This has dimension full parameter, and therefore there is now a tree level anomaly immediate supersymmetry breaking, which is nothing but the superpotential itself. And so you add this piece plus its complex conjugate. So you have basically cosine of the phase, but phase is not just the theta parameter, but also comes with this uh, NC root of unity. So that's how you end up with this cosine. And, and K, goes from zero to one. And therefore, if you look at, at, if you plot this vacuum energy, then looks like this. You have NC solutions. Each of them are shifted by a, a square, the NC root of unity. And what I mentioned earlier is that if you keep increasing theta, you go from one branch, which is red, and switch over to the other one, which is green, that's the next ground state. And then switch over to yellow, that's yet another ground state and so on and so forth. And that's a picture I mentioned to you qualitatively earlier on. So the fact that you can view this gauge genome mass to be induced by a normal immediate supersymmetry breaking, you know exactly how the SUSY breaking effect would appear in a non-perturbative physics after you develop this gauge in a condensate, and you can analyze this fully exactly, even with the finite supersymmetry breaking. And then it does start to resemble the real cow, namely that you can show this gauge in a bilinear condensate, and it's not a continuous set of vacua, it's discrete, and only one of them is a true vacuum. The other one have higher energies, so you have a unique ground state, as you would expect in non-supersymmetric pure young mill theory. So that's the exact result you can obtain now for the uh, case with no flavors. Now I start at a number of quark flavors and while the number of flavors still less than number of colors. This is a case what Cyborg pointed out that the theory exhibits this one away behavior. The theory can now be described in terms of its composite field called the meson. And any value of the meson is actually a ground state at the classical level and which persist at all orders in perturbation theory. But non-perturbatively, the meson field would acquire this potential, which has the inverse power in meson, and therefore the energy goes to zero at the infinity of the moduli space, and therefore has a runaway behavior, and therefore there's no ground state. But the minute you again introduce this anomaly with a supersymmetry breaking, now that this, this dimension of full parameter in a superpotential non-perturbatively, you can work out the tree level supersymmetry breaking effects, which appears at the lower power in this meson moduli field compared to the supersymmetric piece. What it means is the following. In supersymmetric theory, you have this only first piece, which runs away to infinity, which is depicted by this red curve. 
But now that you have this, uh, the three level of Susie breaking piece, which is a lower power in one over phi, which is more important at small value of phi, therefore that creates a dip, while it asymptotes to zero at infinity. And that's how you find this blue potential with the normal immediately supersymmetry breaking. Now, uh, this is actually consistent analysis because the, as long as Susie supersymmetry breaking is small, your minimum is pushed to a very large values. In the limit where Susie breaking vanishes, of course, it runs all the way to infinity. So this field value is large. When field value is large, which means that there's a Higgs mechanism going on with a large quark expectation value, where theory is weakly coupled. Therefore, you can trust the canonical Kähler potential for this meson field. That's how you know exactly what the SUSY piece of the potential is. So this is a self-consistent analysis, namely that in, by the virtue of supersymmetry breaking, you now found the ground state at large field value, which justifies the use of canonical Kähler potential to work out the potential and therefore it's self-consistent. And you can try various direction of field space, but it turns out the direction which maintains this SUNF vector symmetry is indeed the minimum. And you can work out exactly what the meson expectation value is, which goes has the inverse power of SUSY breaking. Therefore, it does run to infinity in a small supersymmetry breaking limit, as you expect. And at the ground state, you do break SUNF cross SUNF symmetry down to diagonal subgroup. Therefore, there is a chiral symmetry breaking. You can even show the components of this meson field indeed become massless pions, proving Nambu's assertion of getting massless pions in this limit. And you also need to integrate the superpartner of mesons like Messino. And the, those fermion loops actually end up inducing the Vestumino Witten term for the chiral Lagrangian. So you get full chiral Lagrangian. You can derive it fully from this analysis, both the kinetic term for the chiral Lagrangian, del u, u dagger del u, together with the Vestumino Witten term to saturate all the normals you need. On the other hand, when the number flavor is one, it turns out the chiral symmetry is all anomalous. Therefore, there's no exact global symmetry. In this case, you can also show the meson direction has a mass, but there's only one component of it. So all the degrees of freedom are actually gap and massive, and hence there's no Goldstone boson. And that's the usual solution to what it's called the U1 problem, why there's no Goldstone boson to U1 axial. And here, what I have compute, computed is the expectation value of the meson field, which is the bilinear field of squawk and anti-squawk. But what you like to, of course, compute is the bilinear condensate of a quark and anti-quark fermion bilinear. It turns out that fermion bilinear is the higher component, F component of this meson superfield. And having worked out the squawk condensate, you can also work out its F component which is just the Susie breaking times the, 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 the squawk bilinear. So even though this is a, a, a very simple analysis, you can show that fermion bilinear is also finite and non-zero in the presence of supersymmetry breaking. And, and it tells you that I can work out this exact result when Susie breaking is small. So this horizontal axis is supersymmetry breaking. When it is much smaller than dynamic scale lambda, I can trust my result. Squawk condensate starts large because in the limit of no Susie breaking is infinite and starts to come down. Fermion bilinear, on the other hand, starts to grow. On the other hand, in the non Susie limit, I expect the quark bilinear to keep growing because of the matching scale of the original Susie gauge coupling together with the Susie breaking will give you low energy gauge coupling constant, which keeps growing. So that's the behavior you would expect. On the other hand, squawk by linear goes like one over uh, squawk mass, and therefore it seems to go down. I cannot reliably compute anything when SUSY breaking is close to dynamical scale. But what you can see here is that qualitatively, they seem to connect continuously from near SUSY limit to non SUSY limit. So that's the behavior I explained earlier, namely two limits seem to be continuously connected. You can even work out the light spectrum of particles uh, in the near Susie limit. 
and it show, as I said, is this uh, the adjoint of the uh, massless pions. There's also the adjoint of the scalar particle. And then the, the particles that correspond to axial, anomalous U1 axial, eta prime and F0. And all of these states are known to exist in the real QCD data. And this fermionic partner, of course, doesn't exist in the non suzy limit. So presumably they would decouple as you increase Suzy breaking, but at least the qualitative feature of this uh, low lying spectrum, uh, again, uh, the sort of looks like the real cow of non suzy QCD. In the case of SUNC QCD, though, there's no clear sense of confinement because they have massless quark in a fundamental representation and any color charge can be screened. So Wilson loop is actually perimeter law, not area law. But if you go to SONC QCD with the quarks in a vector representation, the Z2 center of SONC is still an invariant by the vector representation. Only spinner representation is odd under Z2. So we have a rigorous definition of confinement. So here we expect to see some interplay between the mechanism of confinement and chiral symmetry breaking. Indeed, Intrigator and Cyborg pointed out when you go to specific number of flavors, NC minus two. Having NC minus two flavors condensing, that will leave the SO2 subgroup or SONC unbroken. And SO2 is the same as U1, therefore you have a Coulomb branch. So having this kind of expectation value, SO2 for the lower two rows is an unbroken symmetry, therefore you have U1 gauge group unbroken, and that's when you have exact solution of the two particle monopoles. You have the Coulomb branch, just like for n equal two theory, which is actually parameterized by the determinant of the meson field, which is QQ. So this is the moduli space. And again, you have two singularities. One of them has the origin where dions become massless, massless, but it doesn't lead to actually global minimum, which is very shallow. The other minimum is away from the graph, from the, the origin, where the meson have finite determinant. Therefore, the flavor symmetry is actually broken. At this singularity, the monopoles become massless. And once you actually introduce the anomaly mediation, you can show that monopoles acquire expectation value, well, which turns on as you turn on the supersymmetry breaking. And that would leave you the global minimum, and which appears at the singularity where the meson is supposed to have value. And therefore, the mechanism of confinement due to monopole condensation is intertwined with the mechanism of chiosymmetry breaking due to the meson condensate. And that's a beautiful theory. So it turns out that uh, uh, once you actually uh, demonstrate this mechanism persists even for the smaller number of flavors by turning on the mass of the quarks and keep de decoupling them. So you can keep understanding the mechanism of confinement and chiosymmetry breaking this way. If you go to higher number of flavors, however, the analysis becomes much more complicated. There's especially that in the SUN theory, which doesn't appear for SO and SP theories, there's a baryon field, which may also exhibit a actually condensation. And you have to analyze the, and compare the minimum with the uh, meson condensate versus baryon condensate. At least for NF or NC good one case, you can still show that there is a condensate of the meson, which is the global minimum, which appears now at the small field values. And small field values is where the theory becomes weakly coupled, and therefore you can trust the canonical Kähler potential for meson, and that's self-consistent analysis, just like in the case of the lower number of flavors, and therefore you can still show that there is a chirosymmetry breaking. But if you further go to even larger number of fields, it turns out that you do have to worry about the runaway direction where the U1 barium breaks. It doesn't happen for the most of this range, but once the NF is bigger than 1.44 NC, close to one and a half NC, then the U1 barium breaking actually becomes a double minimum. So the chirosymmetry breaking is no longer a global minimum but still a well-defined local minimum in this case, you can analyze it and show that again, this local minimum seems to be continuously connected by the behavior of the size of chiral condensate. If you go to conformal window, that's even more complicated 
and that requires a more complicated analysis. But I, this is what I just mentioned just a minute ago, namely that even for this large, large number of flavors, you still have this continuous connection in the near CZ limit and non CZ limit in terms of the size of the condensate, both for the uh, scalar quarks and, and fermions. Conform window, as I said, is more complicated, and I don't go, will spend too much time on this. But again, you can find a well-defined local minimum. And this is the running of the scalar masses. It turns out that you have to be on one half of the plane to obtain a consistent minimum that doesn't run away. So there is actually the behavior which uh, is com not, not completely understood uh, from the SUSY point of view, but at, at least we can find again a local minimum with a well-defined color symmetry breaking, which persists up to the number of flavors of three times number of colors. So that's the picture. So I would that's believe that up to three times number of colors, this local minimum color symmetry breaking will smoothly carry over to non SUSY limit. Okay, I'm hearing a question. Yeah, sorry. So let me try to understand the NLP equal NC minus two. You mentioned the interplay between confinement and chiral symmetry breaking. So simply, I think I didn't understand what is the physical picture of in, in, in that region. So if for the lowest number of flavors, is that and, your and, question? Yeah. My question is, and if we call NC minus two, you mentioned about so explain explanation interplay between confinement and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this case. And, and, and if we call NC. So this is up to NC minus one. So so strictly less than NC. So in this case, that you yeah. have this meson field, which is the bidini of scalar quarks turning on at a large value. And if this large, you can view this perturbatively as a condensate of scalar quark in the anti-scalar quark field, which breaks SU and NC gauge group down to SU NC minus NF gauge group by the Higgs mechanism, mm. which happens at the large field values and therefore it's weakly coupled. And then you can trust your calculation based on the canonical kinetic term. Am I answering question? Uh, my question is maybe in the next slide. And oh, this one. Next, and if we call NC minus two. Yeah, so this is part of the case I just discussed. And F is strictly less than NC. So two is uh, less I than see. N3. So what, I mean, what is the interplay between confinement and chiral symmetry breaking? I think yeah. I didn't, yeah. Yeah, for low SUSY breaking, the analysis on the previous slide is supposed to be valid. Then I can compute the squawk by linear as well as quark bilinear, which follows the cyan curve and yellow curve. That's something we can work out exactly. In a non susy limit, assuming chiral symmetry breaking, again, I can show that the, uh, the size of the fermion bilinear keeps growing like yellow curve and squawk bilinear goes down like the cyan curve. In between, when M is of the order of lambda, I lose my control. But by comparing the two limits, they seem to be continuously connected to each other. That's so, the argument. I still, I think I didn't get the point. So what is the role of confinement in, in chiral symmetry breaking here? Uh, as I it, said, for SUNC gauge theory, there is no yeah. strict definition of confinement. So the, 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 the Higgs mechanism and confinement cannot be uh, completely distinguished from each other, and they are smoothly uh, connected uh, from one limit to another. That, uh, that is what is sometimes called complementarity in the literature. I see, I see. But in the case of SO and gauge theory, I showed you that there is a strict sense, and therefore there was actually a magnetic monopole present in the spectrum, which does condense and causes confinement in the strict sense. I stand what about chiral symmetry breaking in that case? Uh, in that as... case, the meson field also is required to condense because you need to be at the singularity where monopole becomes massless. So that's this point here, but meson also condenses, allowing for the monopole to become massless, which also condenses. Therefore, you have condensation of both magnetic monopoles to cause confinement and mesons to cause chiral symmetry breaking at the same time. 
I see. Okay. And I do have to actually rush a little bit because today is actually <laughs> Thanksgiving. And if I, I'm late for the dinner, my wife's going to kill me. So let me quickly go through application of this whole idea to Cairo gauge theory. And SO10 gauge theory 16 is actually a prime example of Cairo gauge theory. And I skipped this slide, but the people expect that this may be the first theory to be analyzed on the lattice. Cairo gauge theory is very difficult to simulate on the lattice. It had never been done. So we don't know anything about its non perturbative dynamics, really. All people have done is to guess. But using the same kind of analysis I showed you, you can show explicitly the symmetry breaking pattern. If we have only one flavors, a global symmetry is anomalous, supersymmetry is broken, and theory is gapped. When you have two flavors, you have SU2 global symmetry, remains unbroken, and theory is still gapped. If you have three flavors, SU3 global symmetry exists, I can show that breaks dynamically to SO3, and therefore theory is no longer gapped, you have the Goldstone bosons. When NF goes four, it turns out that our theory is, is inconclusive, whether SU4 theory global symmetry is broken to SU3 equals SU3 or SU5, both possibilities exist, but it's clear that symmetries do break in this case, and therefore theory is not gapped. In all of these cases, we do not find any massless composite fermions to saturate TOOF normally, and that's our conclusion. It's a definite prediction, so hopefully in the future, the lattice people can simulate this and confirm my prediction. Okay, so what I told you here is this. So here's the conclusion. The supersymmetry in anomaly mediation helps us understand quantum non perturbative dynamics, starting from the spherical cow, that's supersymmetry, but turning on a tiny, but to find a Susie breaking will still allow us to solve the theory exactly, which does look like actually the real cow, namely non Susie gauge theory. We obtain results consistent with the old ideas by Nambu and Yukawa. Uh, the global and local minimum, uh, either, uh, either global local minimum uh, seem to be continuously connected to non suzy limit by looking at the behavior of the condensates. And I can apply this to systems not understood yet, namely the Cairo gauge theories, and you can analyze them. And in principle, this technique can be applied to three-dimensional and two-dimensional systems, which might be interest for the strongly correlated condensed matter system. And this effort is still ongoing. So, and, and it can also appear sometimes in dark sector of the composite dark matter models, which I also worked on before. And so that's what I want to tell you today. Okay, that's that's it. Any quick questions? I really need to go, <laughs> sorry. Oh. Okay, thank you very much, Itoshi, for the nice talk. Uh, let, let's take just quick questions. Uh, um, okay, let me start. You, you mentioned SO10 in the later part of your talk. Can you say some, something about the grant unification? Yeah, and, so and your, certainly there's an interest from grand unification. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the SO10, SU5 gauge theories, they are Cairo theories. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we normally uh, live in this opportunity regime where gut symmetry is broken. Mm -hmm. But at least you can ask the question, what happens if it isn't? Mm -hmm. And then you are, of course, subject to the non perturbative dynamics of SU5, SO10 theories, even E6. And, and it had not been understood. And at least my approach here is a concrete method where you can analyze the behavior of these theories and make definite predictions. And of course, I can't guarantee that they are smoothly connected to non suzy limit because we don't know what the mm -hmm. non suzy limit is. But in principle, that can be tested by lattice stimulation in the future. Right. Thank you very much. So is there any other questions from the audience? Maybe I can take one more question. Maybe people want to <laughs> give you more time, um, uh, Hitoshi. Okay, no more okay. questions from the audience. So okay. thank you. Thank you thank again you for, for your nice talk. Thank you very See much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye now. Bye.